A very warm welcome to each of you this December evening. Contemplative tradition, that's ours and those whose shoulders we lean on, is a practice that has served the world for a long, long time. We have been mentored by some of these women and men whose contemplative practices have impacted not only ourselves, but the world. Some of these contemplative mystics are recognized by institutional status, for instance, by the church, or by their historical contributions, while others, others are not necessarily official. Yet all of them are men and women who are committed to search for a deeper contact with God. Tonight, we'll learn more about them and even ourselves. If you could be with me right now, we'd begin our night by being in this beautiful cloister setting, an environment which replicates the cloister garden and chapel of our founding congregation. They are the Dominican Sisters of the Holy Cross, still praying and ministering in Regensburg, Germany, even to this day. From the cloister garden and chapel, we then move towards our beloved homecoming farm. This piece of land provides another sort of cloister with its abundance and scarcity and its unique beauty. Both the enclosed cloister garden and the farmland invite us to tend to our relationship with divine mystery. And that's what we'll do tonight, reflect on such a relationship this evening, sincere thanks then to you who join us 
as we celebrate the lives of a few Dominican contemplatives and of another one, Julian of Norwich, whose words have become a universal mantra, all will be well. I don't know about you, but while life's circumstances at times seems to defy her hope-filled spirit, her belief that living in God will bring a sense of wellness has lifted people up throughout the ages. And so it is my honor to present to you Sister Gail Barcelo. She's a friend, a teacher, and a lover of Julian. Gail's wisdom, contemplative spirit, and passion will guide us through our time together this evening. So gratitude to Sister Gail and to you who so generously support our congregation's sponsored ministry, Homecoming Farm, and its educational components, which have impacted lives for over 25 years. Your partnership with the Homecoming staff has honored Earth and its abundance by feeding guests at Hempstead's Inn and families of immigrant students in another one of our congregational sponsored ministries, Opening Word. So let's enjoy the evening, let's learn, and most of all, may we truly trust in God's vision that all will be well. Welcome everyone. I'm Elizabeth from Homecoming Farm, and I'm so honored to welcome you here this evening. Tonight we celebrate the beautiful tradition of contemplation of the Sisters of St. Dominic, as well as the spiritual legacy of Julian of Norwich. We begin here in this beautiful sacred space, the chapel of the Sisters of Amityville, that is a replica of the chapel in Regensburg, where the first Dominicans came from that came here to Long Island. We also will be celebrating our farm, homecoming, which the Sisters of St. Dominic have made a decision to save the land and also to honor Earth and all of this community in the process. So tonight, I hope this will be an evening of mystery, mysticism, grace, and blessings for each one of us, and I welcome all of you. The Dominican order calls us to share the fruits of our contemplation. Churches and chapels reflect the community doing the building. Queen of the Rosary Chapel was built when the congregation was second order, so it's no surprise it has contemplative monastic influences. Monastic life was one of enclosure. The lives of the sisters were given over to prayer, study, and common life. Our chapel reflected this not only in the choir to choir stalls and grill, but in the choices Mother Serafina Samer would make in the, of paintings on the wall. Of the eleven women saints and blesseds, five were abbesses or prioresses, and often founders of the monasteries they led. Among the earliest Dominican nuns was Cecilia Cesarini and Diana D'Andola, who were friends and contemporaries of Dominic. Blessed Diana had a vow to Dominic that she would build a monastery in Bologna. Dominic became her spiritual director and later Jordan of Saxony. In 1223, the monastery of St. Agnes became a reality in Bologna and Diana and her companions received the Dominican habit from, from Jordan. The friendship of Diana and Jordan recorded the early history of the order in his letters to her and her community of St. Agnes, which she preserved. Blessed Cecilia Cesarini was a young nun in San Sisto. She spent 80 years as prioress in Diana's monastery of St. Agnes in Bologna, where she was sent to form a new monastery in the Dominican tradition. One of her most precious gifts to Dominicans was her description of Dominic's physical appearance. Blessed Emily Bicieri was born at Versilli. She refused her father's plans for her to marry and convinced him to build a convent, Santa Margarita, 
in Vercilli. It was the first of the Third Order Dominican tertiaries, of which she became abbess when 20. Having been elected prioress against her will, Blessed Emily governed with tact and ability and was reaffirmed as prioress in 1273. Blessed Zetislava lived a very frugal and prayerful life and cared for those who had lost their homes during the Tartan invasion. To her husband's displeasure, St. Zetislava spent much of her family's money on aiding the poor. She convinced him, the Duke of Lemberg, to build hospices and to support the care of refugees. When St. Zetislava came into contact with the newly arrived Dominicans in Bohemia, St. Hyacinth, St. Zetislava became a Dominican tertiary and the founding benefactor of the order in Bohemia. She was responsible for building the priory of St. Lawrence near her castle and in the convent in Jablone. In her teens, St. Agnes of Multipuziano joined the Franciscans in Multipuziano and rose to become its prioress. In contemplation, she had visions of Mary. In 1306, God inspired Agnes to found a Dominican convent with three stones given her by the Blessed Mother in honor of the Trinity, Santa Maria Novella in Florence. She is reported to have cured people and have been frequently called upon to bring peace to the warring families of the town. A member of the wealthy Derici family, at the age of 13, Alessandra entered the Third Order Cloistered Monastery of St. Vincent in Prado near Florence. At the reception of the habit, the young novice received the name Catherine. In time, after the community's acknowledgement of Catherine de Ricci's gifts, she was elected novice mistress and later prioress. To the community, Catherine was a firm and prudent prioress. To the individual sister, she was always an attentive listener, patient and sympathetic. This attitude likewise characterized her ministry of service to the many visitors from all walks of life who came to her for advice direction and prayers. One of her favorite ways to help the poor who came to the monastery was to give them bread she herself had baked. Catherine was wont to say to her sisters, see that no person leaves the convent without being consoled and comforted in some way or another. Rosary Hall Chapel, Queen of the Rosary Chapel, was dedicated in 1878 a gift of the contemplative spirit. To praise my soul rejoices in God to praise my soul shall glorify the Lord. God, who is mighty, has done great things for me. Behold the servant of God. Magnificat, Magnificat, Anima mea Domino. Magnificat, Magnificat, Anima mea Dominum. To bless, to bless the people of God, to bless, to bless the name of the Lord, all generations shall call me blessed. Behold the servant of God. Magnificat, Magnificat, Anima mea Dominum. Magnificat, Magnificat, Oh.
to preach, to preach the word of our Lord, to preach, to preach the truth to the earth. Teach us to follow God and show us the way for holy is God's name. Magnificat, Magnificat, Anima Mea Dominum. Magnificat, Magnificat, Anima Mea Dominum. Wendell Berry, the Kentucky farmer, poet and social critic once said, you don't know really who you are until you know where you are. Home Farming Farm, since its very beginning, has been about this sense of place, knowing where we are, rooted in the soil of Amityville, knowing of the worms and the bees as community, and because we know where we are, we then know who we are. Tonight we're gathering here in this beautiful chapel of Queen of the Rosary, knowing that we go back all the way to Regensburg and to the many women who were there and the many women who were here in this chapel, so, so many. And in my early 20s, I spent a lot of time in this chapel as a postulant, a novice, and then I professed my vows here in this very chapel. And so it's a very, very wonderful place to be. And I thought at that time that I knew who I was, and I thought I knew where I was. But it's been a long journey, along with all of us Dominicans here, to know now that we're in a new place. We now have discovered that we are living in the Milky Way galaxy, that we are cosmic people, and that has made all the difference. I used to think that to contemplate I had to leave the world. But in this journey that I've been on, I've discovered I don't have to leave the world. I have to go more deeply into the world, more deeply into the earth, where all the wisdom is. And so we have journeyed from this place, this chapel, this understanding, to a new place and a new time, from the cloister to the cosmos. It's such a wonderful homecoming. And we're gathered here this evening to connect with one of our ancestors, Julian of Norwich, who lived so many centuries ago, but who has so much to tell us. She lived in a time like we're living with so many unknowns, with a pandemic. But she has the words to tell us that all shall be well. So we've invited Sister Gail Orsello from Green Mountain Monastery to be with us this evening. And she will catch glimpses and tell us all about Julian. Gail Orsello is a co-founder with the late passionist priest and cultural historian Thomas Berry, along with Bernadette Bostwick of the Sisters of Earth Community, the first community of Catholic sisters in the world founded specifically for earth healing and protection. This new emergence in the Catholic tradition seeks to give expression to a theology rooted in the evolutionary dynamism of an unfolding universe. 
Gail is a teacher, presenter, and leader of programs and retreats worldwide on the interchristic field, which is collective transformation as activism for our time, as well as the integration of the evolutionary thinking of Thomas Berry with the call of Pope Francis and his encyclical Laudato Si to care for our common earth home. Gail holds degrees in clinical psychology and Christian spirituality and divides her time between life at the monastery in Vermont and establishing new Thomas Berry houses around the world. Gail is a liturgical dancer also, choreographer and performer using dance as an embodied expression of praise and adoration of the divine and as a vehicle for social change. And so we welcome Gail Worcello. All shall be well, and all shall be well. All shall be well, all shall be well. All shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. Hello, everyone, and greetings. Uh, my name is Gail Worcello, and I am the co-founder, along with Bernadette Bostwick, and the late passionist priest and cultural historian Thomas Perry of Sisters of the Earth Community in Greensboro, Vermont. I am thrilled to be here and honored to be invited by Homecoming Farm to celebrate the wisdom of Julianne of Norwich and to follow my dear friend, Kathleen Dignan, who opened us up to the world of Hildegard of Bingen last year. I'd like to express my gratitude, particularly to the sisters of the Amityville Dominicans for your beautiful lives of service and your charism of knowing, loving, and following Christ, which, which is a charism that would have been so close to Julian's heart. Gratitude to Jean Clark, the founder of Homecoming Farm and a longtime friend, to Elizabeth King, uh, the current director, to Don the Farmer, and to Dan Brennan, who put all of this wonderful program together. And also to all of you who are behind the scenes for bringing this forward. Thank you to all of you. So let's begin and explore Julianne of Norwich. Now, in our time together, we're going to discover Julian in three parts. So in the first part, we will look at how she expressed herself in Middle English, who it was she wrote for, and we'll find out where her revelations came from. And also, we'll find out why Julian can be called the queen of three. In the second part, we'll get a sense of her historical context. What was Norwich like in the 14th century? And how did the times shape Julian's writings? And what happened in the anchorage, that enclosed space with two mysterious windows in which Julian lived for over 20 years? And then finally, we'll take a look into her timeless revelations called showings, with a particular focus on the 14th revelation. And it is here that in this revelation, Julian will introduce us to what is called the exemplum. And we'll explore how it may invite us into a deeper love in action for our world. So I would like to begin with some slides and we'll take a moment to put those slides on here. So we gather today to celebrate and explore Julian of Norwich, the 14th century down-to-earth mystic, accessible theologian, and feminine voice of sanctity, who wrote particularly for the benefit of the people of her time. 
people like ourselves living in chaotic times. Julian offers us a radical, optimistic theology, one that reveals the feminine face of divinity, the loving mother who wraps, enfolds, embraces us, and tells us how much we are loved. Lo, how I loved you, are the words Julian hears in her 10th revelation. Now, Julian's way of writing was her way of speaking intimately with her readers for whom she called her even Christians or fellow Christians. Julian uses simple images to express complex con concepts and writes especially for those who assume they are unworthy to receive God's grace. One of her simple images is that of a hazelnut. So in Julian's time, Hazelnut trees dotted the English countryside, and the fallen nuts were gathered into baskets, and women like Julian would ground the nuts to make paste or sauce, or follow recipes that called for butter the size of a hazelnut in their cooking. Hazelnuts were so common and so ordinary that Julian wondered why a hazelnut could have any importance. So in her first revelation, a hazelnut appears in her hand, and she asks, what might this be? And the answer came to her, it is all that is made. And Julian wonders, how could this be all that is made? And it dawned on her then that this hazelnut stands for all creation. This is Julian's cosmic awareness. Why does anything in the universe exist at all? What keeps it in existence? And Julian hears these words. It lasts and ever shall because God loves it. All matter in the microcosm or macrocosm exists and is sustained because of God's love and is an expression of God's love. So take a look at this. Here is a sample of her writing. When Julian received her revelations, they came to her in three forms. So you may have noticed the word ghostly in the uh, in the slide before. Uh, so the way they came to Julian was either bodily, which means she saw uh, vivid images. Uh, she had a bodily sight. Second would be a ghostly revelation, which means a revelation came to her through her own spiritual sight, spiritual insight. And then thirdly, the revelations came to her through locutions or words that were formed in her understanding. So Julian wrote in Middle English, which was the language of the common folk, not the language of the church, which was Latin. And Middle English was still an unformed vernacular. So Julian had to figure out how to create a language that would express her own mystical experiences and theological insights. So to give you a flavor of Julian's language and to tune your ear to her Middle English, here are four Middle English words used in Julian's revelations, expressing key concepts in her experience of God. Let's take a look. Now, many times throughout the revelations, Julian uses the word seker. Seker meaning true, certain, noble, and therefore secure. So Julian writes of God saying the words to her, I keep thee full securely. Oneing, Julian writes, we are endlessly one to God in love, inseparably knitted. Homeliness. 
Homeliness meant familiar, intimate, very close and near. And Julian writes, in us is God's homeliest home and endless dwelling. And then finally, courtesy. Courteous for Julian meant warm, welcome, nightly, elevated. And she writes, our courteous Lord showed full sweetly and full mightily the endlessness and immutability of his love. Let's take a look at these four words that Julian used in a sentence. So for a moment, take these words in and just get a sense of Julian, the sense of her, uh, her warmness, her, her own courteousness and homeliness, the, the sense of uh, her expression of uh, familiarity with the divine. There we're one with God. We're secure in, in God. Feel into Julian's heart space. Now, Julian is also known as the queen of three. All through her revelations, we experience the rhythm of three, which has an alchemical effect, the power of the triple affirmation. So the, the triple affirmation most known to us is this one, all shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. And we can feel the cadence and the rhythm of this triple affirmation. It just seems to fit into our own uh, emotionality, our physiology. We can walk with it and be with it. But this isn't the only triple affirmation. This, uh, tr this, this uh, properties of three uh, run through Julian's writings. And I'll give you a few examples. She says, we'll go back to the hazelnut three properties of the hazelnut. God made it, keeps it, and loves it. The three things we need most, love, longing, and compassion. The three ways of seeking God, willfully, gladly, and without grumbling. The three aspects of the divine, Father, Mother, Everlasting Lover. And finally, three ways to approach God. Naked, plainly, and homely. And we could go on and on. There are many more uh, threesomes in the writings of Julian. So now that we're inside this rhythm of three, I would like to uh, begin where Julian begins, which is... Uh, in the dance of three. So Julian begins her book of revelations, revelations of divine love in a matter of fact tone by introducing herself to us very directly, telling us that she was nobody special, a simple creature that could read no letter. That means she could not read Latin. And she writes that the 16 revelations or showings comprising her work were shown to her in the year of our Lord, 1373, on the eighth day of May. But before she relates what the revelations were, she relates and tells us about her visionary experiences and how the showings came about. She shares some personal background information with us by confessing that as a young girl in the throes of spiritual idealism, she prayed to God for three gifts. The first was to bear witness to the passion of Christ. The second was a bodily illness that she asked, uh, that she asked for receiving at the age of 30 that would take her to the threshold of death, but not over so that she could trust God fully and return uh, to love God more. And then the third was her desire to receive the triple wound of contrition, compassion, 
and a longing for God. Now, Julian's second prayer was answered when at the age of 30 years old, she experienced a near-death illness. And Julian writes that at the age of 30, she was dying, and she had been suffering excruciating pain from some unknown illness for seven days and nights, and had received the last rites and was paralyzed from the middle down. Her mother, who was at her bedside, sent for the local priest who came quickly with a crucifix and placed it at the foot of her bed. The priest told her to place her eyes on the crucifix. So after this, Julian's eyesight began to fall, fail and all went dark. Yet she remembered that around the crucifix, there was a natural light beautiful light streaming from Christ's countenance. Julian began to die and felt the steady draining of life from her body. But suddenly, she writes later, that all pain was taken away and she was made completely whole. In this moment, she was cured of her deadly illness. And so from 4 a.m. to 3 p.m., on May 8, 1373, Julianne received 16 revelations from Christ, which filled her heart with humility, empathy for all beings, and a yearning for union with God. And that was the fulfillment of the three requests she made as a young girl. So as soon as Julianne was well enough to sit up, she began to record every detail of the 16 showings revealed to her as she hovered over the threshold of death. And this account is known in the literature as the short text. Now, 20 years later, wanting to stay close to this awakening experience and having enclosed herself in a small cell called the Anchorage, Julianne began to fill out her notes with reflections on the meaning of those visions, which then became known as the long text. So let's just take a moment to reflect on what we have just heard. Those Middle English words. And Julianne as the queen of three. and the beautiful three gifts that she asked God for as a young girl. And the fulfillment of those three with that particular emphasis on her near-death experience at the age of 30 from which these showings uh, came forth. So now we'll move into the second part. In records of bequests during her time in the anchorage, Julian is referred to as Julian Anchorita, the anchoress of Norwich. Now, Norwich is located about 100 miles northeast of London. And at the time, the city was a vibrant and thriving commercial hub and it was the easternmost city of the realm during Julian's lifetime. The city was protected by the winding River Wensum on the east and by two and a half miles of stone walls on the other side. Now, these walls were three to six feet thick and 12 to 20 feet high. So in many ways, Julian lived an enclosed cloistered life from her birth. Julian was from a middle-class family, and it seems probable that she was the daughter of a cloth merchant. And she lived in a tortured era, the 14th century. So what was going on at the time of her life? First, it was the time of the Hundred Year War with France. 
So she never knew a world without war. And it was the time of the first ever nationwide English peasants revolt in 1381, in which 20,000 armed serfs looted, burned, and murdered throughout the country. It was also the time of the 40-year Great Schism, the Papal Schism, during which two popes claimed the papal throne, one in Rome and one in Avignon, and then eventually a third in Pisa. But most shocking of all, it was the time of the six recurring cycles of the Black Death, or the Great Pestilence, which decimated half the population of Europe. The first wave of the Great Pestilence arrived in Norwich in 1349, when Julian was only six years old. Julian probably lost half of her family, as death was everywhere. There was no comfort for the dying, no one to give absolution, as she writes. It was a time when Pope Clement VI granted a general remission of all sins to those who died. And later on in her, in her writing, she wrote, I did not like to live. I was weary of life. Now, Julian would have gone to school till the age of 10. And it is probable that she had been married with two children, all of whom died during the recurrences of the Black Death. Women during Julian's time were not allowed to attend the university or become a doctor, a lawyer, or a theologian, nor were they allowed to write about spiritual matters under threat of imprisonment, excommunication, and even death. So what might have saved Julian? How were these writings able to manifest and be saved and and actually get out there. Um, so perhaps we can consider the fact that Julian lived in an anchorage. So as mentioned, Julian was referred to in records of bequests as Julian Anchorita, from the Latin meaning to withdraw from the world, to live a life of prayer and contemplation. Now, to be given permission to become an anchorite and live in an anchor hold, which was a small space attached to the side of a church, Julian had to undergo ecclesiastical examination to determine that she was sound of mind and body, free of debts, morally without blemish, totally orthodox, and able to support herself by income or bequests so as not to be a burden to the church. Now, becoming an anchorite was formal and final. There was a rite of enclosure, including a requiem mass of the dead. The last rites were given, along with the sprinkling of ashes and the blessing of the anchorage. A stern warning was also given to Julian that she must remain enclosed for the rest of her life under pain of excommunication. Then the final dramatic act of the bishop happened, whereby he bolted the door and closed it from the outside. The anchorage was literally a small room attached to the church, the Church of St. Julian. It was about a nine by 12 room with a dirt floor covered in rushes and herbs, and held a small cot, a mattress, a wash bowl, a lantern, and a, and a wood stove. And uh, incidentally, it is said that Julian had a cat to help with the rodent situation. And Julian would have been tended to by servants who brought her food and emptied her waste bucket, etc. And it's said that she was allowed out by a servant now and then to walk in the church garden as long as no one saw her. But she writes at one point in the Revelations, this place is a prison, this life is a penance. So it was not all that easy for Julian to be in the anchor hold uh, for, for, that, for that many years, 20 years plus. 
What was most interesting about this anchor hold, though, was that there were two windows, one window looking into the sanctuary of the church and the other looking out into the street. The anchoress was a vibrant part of village life in the 14th century. And the anchoress was giving constant service to the larger community by offering counsel and, and guidance. So it is from these two windows that we can approach Julian now in real time through the quantum field of loving exchange flowing back and forth between realms. And as we come to understand that the cloister is the cosmos, there is no separation uh, for Julian. So let's approach the window and see what guidance and reorientation Julian has for our age. So from the window, Julian will offer us three insights from her 14th revelation, containing what was known in the Middle Ages as a, the exemplum or parable. Julian is shown this parable in her imagination in vivid color, and it contains or features two characters, a master and a servant. So the servant is sent out to do the will of his master, which he does willingly and with great love. And Julian tells us, that the servant not only went out to do the will of the master, but sets out running in great haste to do the master's will. Julian brings our attention to the inner position of the servant, which is one of a yielding, a yielding to love, an energetic running to do the will of love. And she invites us into this position a yielding in love to the divine indwelling, to the divine master. And we might imagine this as a, as, a, as a position, even in our own bodies, where we ground ourselves, grounded in the feet, where the head bows to the heart, where the heart and the entire being yields to the master at the center of the self. And when we do this, when we take this position of yielding to the divine indwelling, to the master within, we become an energetic force, like the servant, running with great eagerness in, and in so doing, uh, become capable of, as Julian says, making sweet rivers run in our world. So Julian's first direction to us as we approach the window may be attention to our inner position, a yielding to love, an energetic running to do the will of love in our world with that physical reminder, the grounding of the feet, the head to the heart, the heart and the being yielding to the master at the center of the self. And then the parable continues. So the servant who was running uh, with great alacrity to do the will of the master falls into a ditch. And Julian says he groans and moans and wallows, but may not rise uh, nor help himself in any manner of way. And even though the master was near, the servant could not see him because his face was down. And Julian could not figure out why the servant, who had only great desire to do the will of the master, could fall into a ditch. So in this vision, Julian sees the outward expression of the master as one that's full of compassion, while she also sees the inner expression of the master, which was one of rejoicing. And Julian had to hold these two aspects of the showing in her mind simultaneously. And suddenly she saw that the servant's falling and woe would be turned into high honor and endless bliss, more so than if the servant did not fall at all. 
And it took Julian 20 years to sort this out. And what she came to, the conclusion, was that there is no wrath in God. We are forever and always one in love with our beloved, even if we fall into a ditch. And that is why Julian could say, all shall be well and all shall be well, which clarifies Julian's triple affirmation. Certainly the triple affirmation that most of us have heard and is the most widely quoted of her revelations. Yet there is a, a missing part to the revelation that is crucial to Julian's theology, which is the first, uh, the first three words that come before all shall be well, which are the words, sin is behovely. Sin is advantageous or sin is necessary, but all shall be well and all shall be well. So what Julian comes to in this part of the exemplum is that sin is inevitable, that we will fall into a ditch or many ditches, but all shall be well. And why is that? Why? Because as the exemplum shows us, there is no wrath in God. There is no blame. And the servant in this exemplum is a representative of all of humanity. So Julian's wide heart invites us to take in this directive, uh, not only for ourselves, but for ourselves, and also for the, the world in which we live, for what we're experiencing, what we're seeing, some, some heart that is so wide and so open that could declare this. There is no wrath in God, no blame, just love. And in this second gift of the exemplum for us, she asks us to hold this deep in the, in the core of our own beingness allow this gift of healing, of no blame, of no wrath to just sink in, just permeate the being that we are. And then to extend that out into our world, to our fellow humans. There is no wrath in God. And then finally, and suddenly, Julian tells us that this showing, this revelation of the exemplum vanishes, and she's left to contemplate it for the rest of her life in the silence of the anchorage. And in this third gift, Julian invites us into silence. She offers silence as an alternative consciousness in a world full of noise and endless words that lack gravitas truth or substance. And Julian directs us into the substance of silence. Perhaps she says, invites us to log off, to untether from all of our gadgets for a time, to enter into silence as that river beneath the river of all of our words, so that we can offer the world substance instead of noise. Now, as you can well imagine, Julian in the anchor hold is surrounded by silence and her revelations have gravitas because they flow from this eternal ground. And in the end, from inside the silence, Julian asks, what was all of this about? How, what was, what was the meaning of all of these revelations? And she heard these words. Know it well, love was the meaning. Who showed it to you? Love. What was revealed? Love. And why was it shown? For love. So Julian gives us these words to end our time together with her. She says, stay with this and you will know more of the same. You will never know anything but love without end, and all shall be well. Thank you. All shall be well, 
and all shall be well. All shall be well. All shall be well. All shall be well, and no manner of thing shall be well. Thank you so much, Sister Gail. That was really, really beautiful. And it was a lot for us all to take in. So we'd like to offer you two minutes to just quietly reflect with us as we listen to the song, All Will Be Well, which was actually filmed in Dublin, Ireland at the Newman Center that's there. everyone, I'm so happy to welcome you to Homecoming Farm. We've been here for over 26 years, thanks to the graciousness of the Sisters of St. Dominic. We grow food for the people who are SHARE members. We also offer our food to the guests of the Inn and the immigrant women of the Opening Word. We grow food here, that's obvious, we're a farm, but we also run wonderful programs on a range of topics for children and adults, things about sustainability, about organic living, organic growing, mindfulness, community, peace, and now we've added something new on Laudato Si, Pope Francis's encyclical. Truly, this farm is the jewel of the work that we do. As I often say to Sister Jean, if we didn't have this farm, the beauty of this farm, a place to grow food, a place to care for our bees over there, all we would do would be two women traveling around Long Island with a PowerPoint presentation talking about nature. But actually here we can welcome people who can put their hands in soil and really experience the beauty and the wonder of all of creation. In 2011, I read an article about a Trappist monk in Iowa named Brother Joseph Kronbusch. And Brother Joseph, before he became a monk, was a scientist, and he had a tremendous interest in studying garlic. 
So I wrote to him, actually I emailed him and asked him, could he please share with me some of the garlic that he had from war-torn places in the world? Because I had this idea in my head about creating something called a garlic peace bed. And lo and behold, one day a box arrived made out to Homecoming Farm with my name on it. And when I opened the box, there were these heads of garlic, each one of them lovingly wrapped in brown paper with the name of each garlic and where it came from. And the first one that I opened was from Syria. It seems like two weeks later, Syria exploded. And I was so conscious of that garlic that we now held in our hands that we were going to be planting in our soil. And so it became more than garlic to me. It became a symbol of every farmer who ever planted in Syria that garlic, every family member who ever ate garlic that was planted there. And it became a treasure for us to protect into the future. And so the garlic that Brother Joseph gave to me and sent to me is now planted here in this beautiful little garlic peace bed that an actual Eagle Scout helped us prepare William LaMassa. And what's so beautiful about this bed is that I bring children over, we talk about it, we talk about food, we talk about eating. And what's so wonderful is that children understand that sharing food is something all of us do. And what I've reflected on is this sense of, you see this garlic in rows in the beds, but I wonder what if instead of it was in rows, it was in tables that people would join together in. Because what we really need are bigger and longer tables. That would clear out space for humans to share with each other and we would lose the space for war and for separation. I have always been very conscious of the energy of love that's here in this place. The over 100 years of sisters who've walked and prayed on this land, of our many members who've given their energy and their love into growing food that we ultimately share with the hungry among us. And I ask people, do you know who grows your food? Most people say no, they don't. And one of the great tenets of the community supported agriculture movement that we are a part of is it's important to know the face of the farmer. Here at Homecoming Farm, we know Don, who is our farmer, and we're really lucky to have that gift. So lately, I've been thinking a lot about this. I always tell people the love and the energy that you bring to the food that you grow goes into it. And you are the silent guest at every table where the food is shared. In actual fact, at every table, there is a silent guest who is a farmer or a farm worker. But now in this time of COVID, I've been thinking a lot about, well, what if you are homeless and you're not at a table? What if you're eating in a park bench or on the street? What I've come to understand is that our food is still with them. The inn makes it possible for us to share it. And it's not just our food that's with them, it's our love and our caring and our presence. And every person who is a part of Homecoming Farm is the silent guest and the presence of love with each person who shares in our food. So here we have the garlic which we planted uh, back in November and it'll grow throughout the winter and it'll be ready in the uh, summertime. So it's a plant that trans sort of goes over, over through the seasons, through the cold and the, the bleak of winter, and then rises up in the summertime, and in, in the spring and the summertime, to become something that is very, very beautiful. So at this time of the year in December, the farm is um, being closed down, and we are getting ready for, we're getting ready to put the farm to sleep. Um, and so I spend much of my time out here by myself, and I have the opportunity to be on this wonderful piece of property of the Sisters of St. Dominic. And I have my own cathedral here that I can worship in, basically. Um, and when I say worship, I do a bit of meditation, um, usually by uh, saying prayers um, over and over, um, one being the Jesus prayer, the other being the, uh, the Trisagion from the Orthodox liturgy. Being here on the farm, I've come to appreciate um, you know, the, the natural world around me. And, and I've come to understand that we need to care more about the earth. We need to care more about what is going on with, with nature. Because yes, we are commissioned by Jesus to, to love one another, 
But part of that needs to be or should be that we're also loving the earth because that is what keeps us alive and that's why we are here. Um, and so being here at the farm, I get to, you know, uh, experience what's talked about in Psalm 104 where, you know, God's majesty and creating the animals, creating the, 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 the plants, uh, for us the vegetables, uh, the berries, the, uh, the bees, all these things are very, very important. And for me, it's very, they're very, very holy and sacred. And so for someone like Julian, who looks at nature and sees what the connection of nature is with God, um, I very much appreciate what her, you know, her, th her thoughts have been. And as Julian of Norwich said, back in the Middle Ages, all is love, and I get to experience that love every day here at the farm, the love of God for the earth, the love of God for, for the animals, for the plants, and for humankind. And for that, I am eternally grateful. We hope you've enjoyed this evening's presentation, and I want to thank every one of you who spent this evening with us. Some of you may know that in 1216, St. Francis and St. Dominic actually met. Dominic had had a dream the night before, and he recognized Francis in a chapel. He went over to him, and they embraced. And from that time forward, Dominicans and Franciscans have shared a deep bond. Next year is the 800th anniversary of Francis's creation of the Living Nativity in Greccio in Italy. And St. Bonaventure tells the story of how St. Francis wanted to create this beautiful living tableau that would remind people in a very deep way of what it meant for the baby king to be born in a cave surrounded by an ox and a donkey. Francis explained, I want to do something that will recall the memory of that child who was born in Bethlehem, to see with bodily eyes the inconveniences of his infancy, how he lay in a manger, and how the ox and the donkey stood by. Bonaventure tells us, the man of God, St. Francis, stood before the manger, filled with devotion and piety, bathed in tears and radiant with joy. The Holy Gospel was chanted by Francis. Then he preached to the people around the nativity of the poor king, and being unable to utter his name for the tenderness of his love, he called him the Babe of Bethlehem. That sacred tradition has come down through the ages with our creches and our Christmas pageants, and next year we will be celebrating that beautiful event with a Christmas play written by Lena Panino Smith of our communications department with her husband Brian. So tonight, during this Advent season, we close with a prelude to next year and in celebration of another mystic, our Franciscan brother Francis, with the song, Shine Your Light on Us, the Song of Three Wise Friends. Good night, everyone, and Christmas blessings to all.
the 